they will never be pleased with us until we follow their path. And to that, I say, Wallahi, we will never follow your path. Let me mention this example that many may have heard, may hear it right now for the first time. And there's tens more. But let me talk about this one. May it be something new and some nice lessons out of it. Visualize the scene and circumstances with me. This is 10 years after receiving the revelation of Allah in Mecca. He still didn't go to Medina. He's still in Mecca. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just lost his internal support, his wife Khadija. The woman who took him in when everyone ousted him, as he himself said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The woman who believed in him when everyone disbelieved in him. The woman who trusted him when everyone called him a liar. This is what he said about her, his internal support. She's gone now. He lost his external support right after, right about at the same time. He said about his uncle, مَا نَالَتْ قُرَيْشٌ مِنِّي شَيْءًا أَكْرَهُ حَتَّى مَاتَ أَبُو طالب. The man, he said, Quraysh, about his uncle, Quraysh never touched me with harm until my uncle, Abu Talib, died. These were the darkest days in the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the word gets to the Qurayshians that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam plans to leave Mecca. They begin to say, no way. We're not going to let this happen. The harm and torture on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached its peak. The word gets to Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, pay attention. This is in the first volume of At-Tabaqat al-Kubra al ibn Sa'id and the first volume on page 211. Pay attention. And I didn't get it wrong. It's Abu Lahab, the most notorious man who's been for 10 years harming the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who started with a spit at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tabbal lak ali jama'atana. If you were to say who's the most notorious man who harmed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it would be either a competition between Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. Possibly more likely Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, because he had his wife and he had his whole family harming the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Lahab was suddenly moved by the zeal of tribalism and jahiliyyah to defend the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. He seen all the harm his nephew endured after the death of his brother Abu Talib. He shouted, he said, my nephew will go where he wills and whoever goes near to him, I will chop his neck with my sword. You know, this is Abu Lahab talking. Abu Lahab. The surface shallow layman explanation would be zeal of tribalism. That's what moved him. The real reason for me and you is Allah. Allah. Allah used an unbeliever, an enemy of Islam like Abu Lahab as means to protect the message of Allah. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It's the power of Allah. The language of the heavens is different. When you put your faith in Allah, doing what He said, the means come to you in ways you never imagined. When, when they thought the elephants, uh, the size of the elephants were so big and so powerful that it can destroy anything in its sight and it did destroy anything until it reached the Kaaba, Allah sent what to those Huge elephants they thought can destroy anything. Little tiny stones, little baby stones. When an namrud thought he can claim lordship to Ibrahim, قال, أنا أحي Allah sent a fly in his brain to put him, put him to his demise. When Ad thought they were strongest, telling Hud, who's more powerful than us? Bring your Lord. Your Lord powerful than us? Bring him on. Man أشد منا قوة. أولم يروا أن الله الذي خلقهم وشد منهم قوة. Allah sent them wind. When Thamud thought they were strong and mighty, it was just a shout, a little cry to destroy them. When the coalition thought they can destroy Islam and the whole world united against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah dispersed them running away with a little bit of a wind. It is Allah. That's Allah. That's the work of Allah. Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. Allah ends the stories of evil with the smallest means. Take this rule from me. Take this rule from me. Don't occupy yourself ever with how evil ends. Don't occupy yourself ever with how evil ends. Occupy yourself with defending and implementing the truth. Abu Lahab, if he is mentioned, 
animosity and hatred of the Prophet ﷺ is imprinted and embedded in your mind. But for a period of time, Allah, Allah made out of him a protector to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Who made, who made, help me out here, who made out of one of the top notorious enemies of Islam, a man to defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam for a period of time. Allah, you stand your ground, especially in matters of principles, have yaqeen and watch what Allah is going to do. Allah. Allah will make a way out. Allah, Allah will make a way out where there seems to be no way out. That is Allah. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way out for you. The, the one who has control over minds more than I control my mind can bring victory and power. He controls minds more than one controls his own mind. It is Allah, the one who can come between a person in his mind. Do you understand the Quran? Abu Lahab, tabbat yada Abi Lahab watab, who said, don't believe him, he's a liar. The man who led a media campaign against the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, harming the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Suddenly he says, لِيَخْرُجَ بْنُ أَخِي لِمَا يُرِيدْ وَمَنِ اقْتَرَبَ مِنْهُ بِسُوءٍ دَقَقْتُ عُنُقَهُ بِسَيْفِ Something that doesn't enter mind. I can understand when Abu Talib was defending the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib was alive, he defended the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib never became a believer. He played a real, but he never at the same time played a, real, a, a role in harming the Prophet ﷺ. His image was that of a wise man, a calm man, who didn't believe, but he defended. Here you have the notorious uncle who harmed him for 10 years, so suddenly defended him. The one we say, Allah Akbar, Akbar, wanted it and it happened. He's Akbar. Do you really believe he's Akbar? Ya Muhammad. He told Muhammad Go about in your business. Do exactly what you were doing while my brother Abu Talib was alive. Go ahead, spread your message. By the Latin and the Uzza, no one will touch you until I die. The Prophet ﷺ went out in da'wah. For a time period, Protected by the most notorious enemy of his. Allah. Sunnah Allah. The work of Allah. It is Allah who extracts protection from the head of the kufr to the head of Islam. Allah. That's Allah. Ibn al-Ghaytila cursed the Prophet one time. After Abu Lahab said this. Or right before. Do you know who attacked him and physically beat him? No other than Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. Heard he cursed the Prophet, he ran to him and beat him. The troublemakers now, the people of Fitan, the instigators, go to Abu Lahab. Uqba ibn Abi Ma'ayat and Abu Jahal, Uqba and Abu Jahal, they went, they heard what Abu Lahab is doing. They said, are you defending, this defendant of the Prophet, is it stemming from your belief in him? Did you believe in him? Asaba'ta? Or is it kinship? He said kinship. They breathed a sigh of relief. At least it's not as bad as they thought it was. At least he's still, he's still on our religion. Then they took it a step further. They used Abu Lahab's jahiliya kinship, zeal, for defending the Prophet ﷺ against him. They said, go ask Muhammad where your father is. Is he in heaven or in hell? Meaning, you defended him, Abu Lahab, you're defending him because he's your nephew. Okay, just go ask him where his dad is. Our father, our leader. Where is he? Muhammad's grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where is he? The, the one, he, he gave birth to you. He's your father. Where is he? In heaven or hell? Go ask your nephew. They told Abu Lahab, go ask your nephew where your father is. Abu Lahab went to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, come here, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where's my father? These are lessons to take heed from. Pay attention to the circumstances. He was his, in, just right there, he lost his internal support, it's gone. His external support is gone. He's a man alone, one man alone, a ummah in himself. The Prophet ﷺ is weak and lonely. One of the weakest points of da'wah. 
غرباء. No one knows that but a true da'iyah who faces the circumstances which you feel and go through. He was so weak and lonely that Allah revealed to him Surat Yusuf to make him feel better. And then took him to the heavens in Isra. Right at that time. Because it was one of the weakest points of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone was against him. Today, today, the diluted, watered down, wishy-washy Muslims would have said, come on, come on Muhammad Wasallam. Tell him his father's in Jannah. Let's, let's get it over with. Just win him over. Tell him his father's in Jannah. The Nambi Pambi of today would have told the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, we need the superpower of Abu Lahab to protect us. Don't be a radical. Come on. Come on, just clip your wala and bara a little bit and, and tell him what he wants to hear so he won't harm us. The spineless, the gutless of today would have cried wisdom, 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 go gradual on the kid. They would have said, go gradual on Abu Lahab. Go. The, 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 the topsy turvy who suckle their version of Islam from the intelligence of the West, instead of from deriving it from the Quran and Sunnah, would have told the Prophet ﷺ, you're weak Muhammad ﷺ, you're weak. This is a small window of da'wah opportunity. Aha, interfaith. Yeah, yeah, interfaith. Tell him, you know, make it broad. Make it seem like it's broad. All the Abrahamic religions, well, they're all going to heaven. They're all going to be in Jannah. All of them, all of them. The, the, tell him what he wants to hear. Then after, he becomes Muslim, we'll sit him down, you leave that to us. We'll sit him down and teach him that his father is really in hell. Tell him his father is in, in Jannah because he's now protecting you. You owe him some favors. He will, he will kill and torture you and us. That's what the deviant people of today would have said. But full of confidence, full of yaqeen in Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, your father is with his people. Ma'aqawbih. He went, Abu Lahab walked away. He went told Uqba and Abu Jahl. Muhammad ﷺ just said, my father is with my people. Uqba and Abu Jahl knew what the Prophet meant. That he's in hell. They knew exactly what the Prophet ﷺ meant. And they were right. They knew and they were sure about it. They told Abu Lahab, Go ask him what he meant when he said Ma'aqawmi, he's with his people. Let him make it clear to you. What did he mean? They know Abu Lahab did it. Abu Lahab returns. Imagine the pressure that would be on a man in a predicament that the Prophet is in. That's why I mentioned to you the circumstances around the story. On one hand, you have the biggest leaders, the biggest leader of his time, an ex-enemy defending him heart and soul, and you owe him favors. For defending you. On the other hand, it's the laws and rules of Allah. The sharia of Allah. The Prophet had the opportunity, and it's going to cause him harm. The Prophet ﷺ had the opportunity to sugarcoat it. He could have sugarcoated it. His answer, when Abu Lahab returned, he said, Muhammad, Muhammad, did you mean my father, وسلم, did you mean my father is in hell? The Prophet ﷺ said, Naam. وَمَنْ مَاتَ عَلَى مِثْلِ مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ دَخَلَ النَّارِ Yes, that's exactly what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. Not, not only that. Him and who died and what he died on is in hell. Allah. Allah, it don't matter who is in before you. Allah is going to protect you. Allah khayrun hafidah. Abu Lahab on the spot said, I'm your enemy forever and began to harm the Prophet ﷺ and encourage others to harm him and torture him. لا برحت. لا برحت لك عدوا وأنت تزعم أن عبد المطلب في النار فاشتد عليه هو وسائر قريش He flipped on the Prophet ﷺ and he encouraged others to flip on him and harm him more. The Prophet could have avoided that with one word. He could have sugarcoated it. Are you telling me the Prophet ﷺ had no wisdom? Are you trying to tell me he threw himself and the few believers into danger? At one of the darkest moments of the Prophet ﷺ's da'wah life, why didn't the Prophet ﷺ give him a word to please him to overcome that dark era? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ say, he is with his people and keep it at that? Or Allah knows best. We got fundamental principles there is no compromise on no matter what. No matter what the consequences are, some teachings, we don't accept graduality in them. 
you have to see them how they are. You have to see them how they are. You got to implement them how they are. Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ say, look Abu Lahab, give me a few days, gather a few believers around, and vote on it. Let's vote on it. What is Abu, Abu Abdul Muttalib in Jannah or Jahannam? Gather a few of the Sahaba there and vote on it. Let's vote on it. You don't play games like that with the laws of Allah. It's not a game to be played with. I don't care what alam gave a fatwa on that. That's the laws of Allah. You don't vote. Who are you to vote on it and accept that? Do you think the Prophet ﷺ didn't know he was weak? Do you think the Prophet ﷺ didn't know what the consequence of telling him his dad is in hell would be? Do you think he didn't know all that? But there's no compromise on principles. I'm sorry to tell you that. That's the religion. Don't ever ask Allah for a trial ever. Rather, ask Allah to save you from trials. But establish when in yourself, Iman and Sabrin, that only comes through knowledge. That's why we learn knowledge. That's why we learn knowledge. So when the trial comes, you don't fail. Wallahi, I can number names, names with that. When they were inflicted with trials and how they failed. Of our time. And popular people and people that you may have heard in the media. Don't ever be like those who were And among mankind is those who worship Allah as they were on, on the edge. You see, if you're walking on the edge of a cliff, like a narrow place, like on the edge of this table, if good befalls them, ah, I'm a believer, I'm content. If good, good, everything's going his way. If a trial befalls him, in he turns back on his face, losing both this world and the hereafter. He lost this world, and by him not being pleased that with Allah, what Allah chose with him, he lost the life after. Allahumma thabbitna. Allahumma thabbitna. If he gets what he wants of wealth, and fame, and money, and prestige, and followers, he's with the general flow of the believers. If a test comes, suddenly a test comes, he leaves that path. You hear people now saying, Dua, I want to live happy. I want to go back to my wife and kids. I don't want problems no more. Uh, fitan happened and, and they didn't even see fitan. They didn't even see fitan. It didn't even come near them. They didn't even smell it. You're going to hear someone say, this da'wah isn't, isn't for me. I just heard actually a few days ago. If I'm going to be scrutinized for going to the masjid, I'm not going to the masjid no more. A Muslim follows the guided path and he accepts the baggage that comes with it. Accept the right path and the baggage that comes with it. Whatever outcome Allah has for him, he takes it with an open heart and a bare chest. He takes it with an open heart and a bare chest. Shout and I'm a believer. And we indeed tested those who were before them. You're not any better than them. We indeed tested those before you. We indeed tested those before you. Allah wants to know those who are truthful and those who are liars. The prophets get tested and they get harmed. You're going to get harmed and tested. Comfort, luxury, red carpets in the path of da'wah. It didn't happen to a single messenger of Ulil Azam. It didn't happen from Ulil Azam, the most beloved to Allah of his creation. It didn't even happen to any of the other messengers. And who do we look up to when we say da'wah? When you say da'wah, who's our example da'wah? The messengers of Allah. Do you know any messenger of Allah that didn't live a life of hardship from beginning to end? Those, those are the ideal examples that one looks up to da'wah. Now you see those who made da'wah a job, a career, for fame, for luxury, for going with whatever the trend of that time is, whatever makes you popular at that time, that's what their ideology is. That's what their deen, that's their religion, is whatever is that. If you're on the right path and you have no enemies and you have no trial, then close the door in your house and double check what you're doing. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ In Surah Al-An'am. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ مَا فَعَلُوا فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ We appointed for every prophet. For every prophet. لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا You have to have enemies. Shayateen, devils. Oh, someone said sh shayateen. Look what Allah specified. Not shayateen, only shayateen of jinn. Allah specified shayateen al insi wal jinn. Mankind and of jinn. So no one will say it was about the jinn. In shayateen al insi, inspiring to each other, adorned speech as a delusion. If Allah didn't want, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have done it. 
فذرهم وما يفترون In Surah Al-Furqan, a very similar verse like this one. In addition to the one Surah Al-An'am. وكذلك جعلنا لكل نبي عدوا من المجرمين وكفى بربك هاديا ونصيرا. We made for every prophet, لكل prophet, enemies. He has to have enemies. The Sunnah of Allah. You can't change the Sunnah of Allah. Disbelievers, polyous criminals. Today you have the modernist and and those who you know Allah Alam what they are. Allah said لكل every. This is for who? Me and you. It's for those who are better than me and you. The examples of da'wah. If Allah appointed for every prophet of Il al Azim and every other prophet after that, enemies, you expect a true Muslim on the true path to be free of enemies and problems and hardships and trials and tribulations. Explain that to me. Those fake ignorant heads we have today, the ones we see, the ones we, who assume, they, they have this assumption that they can get everyone to be pleased at them. And everyone in their imaginary mind, they can get them into some big circle of unity. They think they're the new Messiah with such savior powers and knowledge to get everyone in this circle, which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have. Everyone should be happy together and we're on the same page. And they, they want to bring the world together on the wrong pretext and on the account of displeasing Allah. Those need to learn the basics of da'wah. No, not basics of da'wah, but rather before that, the basics of their deen. When you embrace da'wah and you're effective on the true manhaj, on the true belief, you must have enemies. And in a time like today, your, if your speech is true and your tawheed is pure, you're going to have enemies from those who claim to be Muslims before the non-Muslims. لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ Was it mentioned in the Qur'an in vain? Two times. In in Aladina Ajram. Kadwida Ladina Amma. We all know it in Surah Al in, in, in Juzu Amma. We all read Juzu Amma and we all memorize it. In Aladina Ajram, but do we contemplate it? In Aladina Ajram, very those who uh, in this life committed crimes used to laugh at the believers. In Aladina Ajramu, Kanu mina Aladina Amanu, Yadhakun. Wa ida marru bihim yatagamazun. Whenever they pass by the believers, they wink one at each other in mockery. This was talking about the non-believers doing it to the believers. Today we have those who claim to be believers doing it to the righteous believers of Tawheed. When they return to their people, they return just in. And when they saw them, when they see them, they say, Verily, these guys have been gone astray. They see the righteous people of Tawheed, the strangers. The strangers, the true people on the pure Tawheed today are strangers among strangers among strangers. Those who are on the true Tawheed, verily, have gone astray, for example. Verily, they've, how is that? How is that? You know what Dalun? They're deviants. He's a takfiri. He's a khawarij. They threw their labels at him. Okay, you call them these names. Come here, buddy. What's the definition, the scholarly definition of a takfiri? They couldn't tell you. They couldn't tell you. What's the characteristics that the scholars, the ulama mentioned, the ulama of the Salaf, on a khawarij? They don't know. They, 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 what happens is, they hear the crowing of the roosters, and they begin to crow with the dog. I'm not going to say, I'm going to have a little bit more respect and say, they heard the dogs barking, so they began to bark like the dogs. I'm going to say, they heard the crowing of the roosters, so they crow like them. Printed labels ready to be uttered at a moment's notice, without fear of Allah. You see, you as a believer, if you're on the true path, you're steadfast, you're going to be tested. And you need patience. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَضْحَكُونَ Verily, during the world before, those who committed the crime used to laugh at those who believe. Keep these ayat between your eyes. When you struggle, when people complain to me, oh, I'm facing this, I'm facing that. Yes, yes, it's good to consult. But keep these ayat and complain to them. When you're on the guided path and they throw labels at you, and you're sure you're on the path of the Quran and the Sunnah, following the Sahaba and those who follow them in guidance, they mark you, they're happy about you. Pay attention to they, they make fun of you, they harm you. Allah says, So what's the result if I'm patient? Wait for this day. Allah tells you, wait for this day. 
This day, the life after, we're not going to mock no one now in this life. But in the life after, those who believe will laugh at the disbelievers. Those who mocked you, then you can mock them back and laugh at them. Ibn al-Mubarak said, Al-Kalbi narrated from Abi Salih about the verse of Allah, Allah yastahzi'u bihim, Allah mocks them. He said, Abu Salih said, this is the statement of Abu Salih, the torment is for, in addition to the regular torment they get in hell, the, the gates of hell open and they're told to leave. And they quickly, the people in hell quickly head to the doors. When they reach the doors, the gates close, the gates of hell close as part of their punishment. When the believers see them, they begin to laugh at them. There's, there's windows in Jannah that they see the people in hell and that's what he said, Abu Salih said, that's the meaning of That's the day when the believers will laugh at them. Wallahi, there's nothing I look more forward to. Wallahi, there's nothing I look more forward to than the day we are inshallah called to an appointment to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first thing I look forward to. The second thing I look to in Jan forward to in Jannah is the pleasant view from the windows of Jannah on the thrones of Al-Ara'iq with glasses of yogurt and honey and water and looking those in Jahannam who for so long relentlessly tortured and harmed and mocked and killed us. May Allah forgive our sins and keep us steadfast on the straight path so we can get those ranks and levels inshallah ta'ala. We don't mock in this life but there's because there's a chance of repentance. There's always a chance to repent and come back to the right path. But there's a time in the life after where even if it's a relative, where even if it's a relative, you're not going to feel any guilt for mocking them. They get paid fully for what they used to do. You, you're gonna, you get, it's payback time. They get rid you mocked, you get mocked in the life after. Is as, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite us and al-ara'iq overlooking those people who did this to us inshallah ta'ala. In conclusion, not a single messenger or Muslim or reviver who took on this task except he was tested. That's the sunnah of Allah. So we need to strengthen our sabr, work on our sabr, and that only comes through knowledge. So we mean, so, or or some may need to jump off the wagon, and I don't suggest that, but that's the only two ultimatums. And I suggest sabr and knowledge. May Allah keep us steadfast and away from misguidance. Jazakum Allahu khaira wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The rulers who govern by other than Islam replace the entire Sharia with another of their own. But then show off for political purposes or for some uh, gain. They show a little bit of Islamic significance for the ignorant and the bird brained. Uh, they replace the Sharia, ah, they change it, replace it, officially promote, spread, and sponsor interfaith, give their wala and bara to the enemies of Allah, then build a little couple masjids or pass out a couple Qurans and say, look what we do. That can only fool the bird brained people, not a generation raised on Tawheed. It can only fool traitors and bird brain, but not a generation well founded and rooted on Tawheed. Another example is uh, for example is what secularists do. The ideology of the secularists is not Islam, but they will put a touch or smell or scent of Islam in their kufr founded ideology as an appearance so that people will accept them or for other purposes and so they will not be rejected. Same with those who embrace the new religion, the Western, the Western Islam. That's a religion. That's not Islam, that's a Western Islam. Uh, the, we embrace and submit to Islam, the pure, unadulterated Islam, Millat Ibrahim Hanifa. Others choose a different brand of Islam, which is called the Western Islam. But then you'll see they'll put a touch or smell of our Islam in it to fool the bird brain. And that's only, that will only fool people who are not well-founded and rooted and established on Tawheed.